with your audience, I'm you know preaching to the choir here, but addressing the symptoms, why not look at what caused the imbalance to start with? Bring the body back into balance by changing something and allowing our bodies to adapt to that change in a way that supports health. Cue music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two, it's time for Life Interrupted Radio, a show dedicated to practical skills for your mind, body, and soul. We're hoping we'll go in one ear and stay there. Here's the host of the show, Sharon Saylor. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. The NIH estimates nearly 24 million Americans have an autoimmune disorder. To put that in perspective, cancer affects about 9 million and heart disease up to 22 million. You'll be as surprised as I was to find out what autoimmune entails. I brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. So let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio. I'm your host, Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And, oh, my goodness, it's my Friday night. I'm so excited. I hope it's your Friday night, too. It's my weekend. The holidays are almost here. Oh, my gosh, this is a crazy time. And if you have an autoimmune disease, sometimes, you know, you got to be extra vigilant because, of, as I'm always saying, the three major things that changed how the trajectory of my autoimmune condition was diet, sleep, and managing stress better than I had been. In fact, when I look back to the previous, probably rarely manage my stress. So those are my key things that I watch now. And gosh, those are the first things that seem to go out the window, right? During holiday season. Anyway, oh, I've got my, I got chai tea here tonight. Got my wonderful chai tea, homemade almond milk, which I love. Yeah, it's delicious. And I know it probably has a little too much caffeine in it, I think. But whatever, it'll get me through the night. What are you curled up with tonight? That's what I'm curled up with. And I'm so excited. So curl up with your favorite tea or hot beverage. You know, gosh, it's Christmas time, all sorts of fun beverages. And I've got a great guest tonight. Uh, her name is Marion Kalamian. Talk to her. She's got a fabulous new book that just came out. And I've been so thrilled to have her on because we're going to talk about what we eat tonight, and how it affects our health. I think many of you, as you're going from surviving to thriving, like I said here on the Autoimmune Hour, we're all thrivers, that uh, diet, I'll say, I haven't heard from one of you that hasn't said diet didn't play a key component in your becoming a thriver. So tonight, we're going to talk about keto for cancer. Now, I know you're probably saying, what, cancer? Well, I see a lot of similarities between autoimmune and cancer. I really do. I see a lot of similarities in managing our sleep, stress, and diet seem to help both. Now, I know they're treated differently and everything, but I wanted her on because her book is really a timely book based on a huge amount of brand new evidence that benefits of ketogenic diet therapies. And we'll talk to her about what is ketogenics. And it offers fabulous information and guidance for those of us that want to gain a deeper understanding of how diet fits into healing, <laughs> right? right? And she, her passion for this was driven by a personal experience that we're going to talk to her about. That was when I read the, the introduction to the book, I was shocked by her personal experience. And I knew I had to have her on a couple of reasons because the book is awesome. Her personal experience is really compelling. And also she and I, I just, as I read the book, I went, yeah, we're on the same path that you can have it in both worlds. So have your healing in both worlds. You can follow some of Western medicine and some of anything else, nutrition, sleep help, um, psychotherapy help, whatever it is that gets you through, massage, acupuncture. I've done so many of those types of things that really helped me. And I really valued that about her book. It isn't an either or type of book. It's a book that's very comprehensive. So welcome, Miriam. Thanks for being on the Autoimmune Hour. Thanks, Sharon, for having me here tonight. What you were saying for autoimmune, which is diet, sleep, stress, managing all those, it's the same for cancer. It's, it's not just about a diet. It's not just about... When I started down this road, I thought it was just 
you know, diet. And then I, I realized all these other pieces um, are essential. They really are. Right. Oh, well, I can go into more pieces that are essential, too, that I've learned that we'll share in this hour together. And, uh, um, but those are those are my top three for sure. But, but stress falls into so many things for me as past stressors and current stressors. That was my big aha moment when I realized, gosh, you got to uh, look at those past stressors, too. And are they still affecting you in some way? But anyway, first, tell us your story, because that was so compelling. I, I felt for you the whole way because I I have two sons and I was just like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. That is the whole reason for this book. And it's like, if I couldn't write this book and include my son's story in here, there was no sense, you know, doing anything besides this little simple ebook I had had online. But uh, Chelsea Green gave me the opportunity to kind of fold my son's story, advocacy, the science behind the diet, the whole thing. And, you know, and they just let me keep going and building on what I have. So when you say comprehensive, it's like, yeah, it is very comprehensive. It is extremely comprehensive. And I, I've read books on ketogenics before, but I found so many things where I was like, oh, got to highlight that. Oh, wow. Yes. Oh, that substantiates what I think too. Or gosh, I didn't know that. So share with us a little bit about your son's story, and then we'll get into describing what is ketogenics. Yeah, well, it's the my son was four years old. It was December of 2004. He was just a four-year-old beautiful boy. And we learned just before Christmas. It was right around this time of year, actually, that we first, you know, got some indication that there was something really wrong. So we learned that he has brain cancer. Uh, and he's four years old. And we know that anything we do is just kicking the can down the road. Anything that they're going to bring to us is just kicking the can down the road. But we're desperate. There's not a lot of, Dr. Google wasn't like really making inroads in, in 2004. Uh, so within a couple of days of learning that he had brain cancer, we started 14 months of weekly chemotherapy. Unbelievable. So, it is unbelievable. I've never heard anything that long. I, I mean, I'm not an expert on cancer, but. Oh, no, there, you know, it, it, uh, this is the standard of care protocol for kids with this type of brain cancer. And uh, I have to say it was supposed to be a, um, you know, sort of a manageable for 10 years kind of cancer, but his was so infiltrated into his normal brain tissue, um, probably because it was there from his own development in utero. So it was just huge. It was the size of an orange. They said it was inoperable because of the location and because of how much tissue it had infiltrated. And so we went with this um, weekly chemotherapy and it just got worse and worse. He developed an allergy. They um, medicated him for the allergy and just kept on plodding through. And at the end of 14 months, they take an MRI and they go, you know, it looks like it's quieting down. Three months later, this tumor's explode, exploded. So at his first post-treatment MRI, we get this news that now we're back on the roller coaster. So what are we going to do next? We move to another weekly chemo. We do that for 12 weeks. We see that's not working. What are we going to do next? And, you know, I'm looking at, well, the unthinkable. We're going to, like, try surgery now. They said it's inoperable, but there's one guy we find that can do it. He does multiple surgeries. It is, he does two different locations. Uh, and yeah, it, you know, it, 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 there just wasn't enough of the tumor that he could remove to make a real impact. Did a lot of damage. But at that point in time, you know, in the look back, it's like, what do you do with a tumor the size of an orange if you can't like whittle it down a little bit? So we did that. And uh, within eight weeks, the tumor in the hypothalamic portion had grown back and had like was 25% larger, invading new areas now. And so what are we going to do? We put him into a clinical trial. I thought, well, this is our last best hope. Halfway through the clinical trial, we find out that it's not working. Oh, my gosh. I, so I just can't imagine. I, I mean, we hear the stories, but gosh, bad enough when you're trying to deal it with yourself. But when it's your own child, it's... Yeah, very, he's not even much. seven yet. And we're at the end of what is considered, you know, possibly to have an impact. And now they're going to move him to palliative care, which sounded really reasonable to his oncologist. It's like, oh, yeah, no, it's just like, just kind of matter of fact. It's like, oh, my God, 
palliative. He's not even yeah. seven. Yeah. So, so I'm online because by 2007, there was some more information online. And I'm looking at one of the drugs they're going to use. They're going to use four drugs in the palliative care. Two of them, he's already failed. So what, you know, what are we doing here? Right. And I'm looking up one of the drugs. I bookmark it because I want to go back to it. And a few days later, when I go back to that site, that paper is gone. That information is gone. And Dr. Seyfried, Dr. Thomas Seyfried, Boston College, his research on ketogenic diet, calorie restricted in a mouse model of a brain cancer. And it was like, wow, what's this? Well, it was Science Daily. So it's like the, the information on the chemo drug was gone and there's this paper instead, Science Daily. So I was not looking for an, for an anti-cancer diet. I was looking at a drug. And here I've got this anti-cancer diet. Yeah, it's a mouse model. We're not supposed to pay attention to mouse models. But in, you know, in this text was uh, mention of two pediatric brain tumor patients from the 1990s. So these were kids that were put on a ketogenic diet eight weeks, and the glucose uptake by the tumor was reduced by over 20% in both kids. And I'm like staring at this in disbelief, <laughs> emailing Dr. Seyfried, and, and it's like, what's this? Wow. So he sends me what, it, what little information there was, which was a couple of his papers, some information about the Charlie Foundation that had been doing this diet for epilepsy since basically since the mid-90s. But the, the diet itself came from the 1920s, from the Mayo Clinic, for epilepsy in kids. So it's like, well, here's this thing in kids that may have some impact. And, you know, it's like I'm still not very hopeful. I, I go to his, his um, pediatric specialist, the oncologist. He was, you know, he'd failed the clinical trial. Um, and he just rolls his eyes. Just it's like total intimidation. Rolls his eyes, tells me flat out this isn't going to work. And then he takes this added intimidation step. He gets his little his buddy on the phone from another center, a well-known guy. And he's telling me, oh, the Atkins diet is for fat people. Stick to the plan. Well, <laughs> Sharon, what was the plan? The plan was to stick him in palliative care and treat him till he died. Right. So it's like this, right. is, you know, this is not much of a plan. And they, had, they couldn't come up with a single um, medical or nutrition objection to the diet. It was just their opinion that it wasn't going to work. So as a mom, it's like, well, so no one has any faith that this is going to work. But, you know, what's the harm in trying? What have we got to lose here? So I was still... Like, I think a lot of moms say that. <laughs> what's that? I think a lot of women, I said moms, but I think a lot of women say that, especially with autoimmune. I hear that oftentimes where I said... Well, one of my favorite stories that I tell is my first visit to one of the specialists when I was at the height of the disease. They said, so what are you doing so far? And I said, oh, I'm eating organically and I've given up grain and I, uh, gluten and sugar and uh, dairy, you know, the whole list. And, and he looked at me and straight face said, none of that's going to work. Yeah. And I looked at him and I said, it's not going to hurt. <laughs> Exactly. It's like, this is what I tell people, because I'm very, very, very into empowerment and self-empowerment and advocacy. So I, you know, they get, people get very discouraged when their doctors don't, don't support them in this. But, you know, I turn it around on the doctor and, and, and say, if your doctor says diet doesn't matter, then you just got the green light. You can eat what you want. And it's like, you know, the light goes on and they just, it's like, oh, Okay. Oh, it's so funny. It, I tell the story. So if some of our avid listeners, sorry about this, but I haven't ever told this to Miriam. The minute he said that, and I even had the retort back to him. And so I felt a little victorious that part of me shot back at this doctor with something. See, this other little thing popped up on my shoulder, whispered in my ear. See, I told you I could have had the milkshake. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. So yes, and and I do say that. So it's a it's a choice. So once the doctor says diet doesn't matter, then you can either choose ketogenic or you could sit on the couch and eat potato chips. So it's it is about your choice. But my God, just give it a try. If you if you you know have that little bit of you know could it work for me? It's like I said, we really didn't have a whole lot of faith that this was going to make a big impact. How could diet? make that big an impact when all these high-powered drugs had not made an impact. Right. Well, 
it did. I mean, I was shocked when you mentioned in the book how fast. So you tried this the diet. We'll get into what the diet is in a minute, guys. But so you tried the diet, and what happened? I mean, I was just like, whoa. Yeah. Well, and, and I want to emphasize that we, you know we still wanted to stay connected to the oncology world because you know one thing we we were certain this wasn't really going to be the answer. His local oncologist, who had a much bigger heart than the pediatric specialist, where my son was number seventeen, never had a name, and I was mom. Um, oh, but you know our local guy knew us. Our local pediatrician was very very you know involved and supportive, uh, and they agreed to monitor, to medically monitor the diet for a three-month trial. And we were going to follow the exact protocol that was used for kids on the diet with epilepsy, so another pediatric population, so the diet was totally appropriate. So we just, you know, we went ahead with this. And at the end of three months, he had an MRI, and his tumor had not just stopped growing. It had shrunk back. From the margins, that infiltration, it had, it had shrunk back and it was smaller in all the dimensions. So, I mean, it, this was shocking. Nobody expected this. So, yeah. in, in, where I went to immediately with this is, yeah, well, it worked. And, you know, but I don't understand why it worked. We were just kind of following this little roadmap and it worked, but I don't understand why and I've got to know more. So, I, I, I begged the Charlie Foundation nutritionist to talk to me. She, you know, initially it was like too much liability, but she did. She talked to me. And at the end of that 90 minutes, I found out all of the things of which there were many that I was doing wrong um, with the diet and implementing the diet with Rafi and kind of set things up a little bit differently. And at that point, I knew that I had to go back to school to get that kind of knowledge that I needed. I wasn't going to get it online because it was just so limited in 2007. So within a couple of months after talking with her, I was enrolled in a graduate program. And the the ironic thing is it was a very uh, traditional uh, graduate human nutrition. It's the same program that registered dietitians take and talk about, I mean, I think that's where I got my, my, um, my self-advocacy chops was coming up against registered dietitians who one of them was so bold to say that I should just let nature take its course. Can you imagine as a mom being told, let nature take its course rather than go outside of the box of what uh, registered dietitians are taught to or actually trained to say about Mm. diet and balanced diet and antioxidants in the food and keeping saturated fats low and all the other stuff that turned out to be totally irrelevant to what was working for Rafi. Oh my gosh, that that is just so uh, heartbreaking to hear and heartwarming to hear too. I mean, uh, self-advocacy, that's one thing, I, that's one muscle that I extremely <laughs> exercise during my yeah. healing period too. We need to take a quick commercial break, everyone. We'll be right back with Miriam and we'll be talking about what is ketogenic, get a little bit more into this diet because in all honesty, the word's kind of a scary word when you look at it, spelling and everything. So we'll uh, make sure that it's not scary. We'll be right back. Life Interrupted Radio will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by lifeinterruptedradio.com to learn more. Do you want to be a better leader? Have better relationships? Become more self-aware? Be a better communicator? Hi, I'm Sharon Saylor, best-selling author, professional speaker, and executive coach. And my life passion is empowering professionals to be the best that they can be. After years of working with professionals, I've discovered the seven things nobody is telling you that can cost you your clients, sales, and even your career. And I want to give it to you free. You've heard my show. You know my passion. And maybe we'll be working together sooner rather than later. So go grab this ebook now to find out the seven things that's costing you big time over at SharonSailor.com forward slash radio gift. Your Conscious Lifestyle on Steroids. OM Times Radio. IOM FM. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, 
please visit humanityhealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living, a chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. I'm Fidel Nshombo. I was born in a city called Bukavu in the Congo. We were a loving family and then boom, everything that I had disappeared in a single day. People think that when you are a refugee and they resettle you to America and all your problems are done. They don't understand that that's the beginning of everything. I was not born a refugee. I was made one. It's time we welcome refugee families with open arms. Learn more at EmbraceRefugees.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio. I'm your host, Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com, and I'm here with Marion Calambian. And she's got a fantastic new book called, called Keto for Cancer, Ketogenic Metabolic Therapy as a Targeted Nutritional Strategy, which is a real mouthful for most of us. But I'll tell you, the book is, uh, when I first read the title, Miriam, I was a little like, oh my gosh, this sounds hard to read. I was so pleasantly surprised that I could read through it and understand it all. It was in a very usable format. So thank you, even with such a semi-intimidating title, everyone. Get the book because it's fantastic. It, she really goes very comprehensive. So, Miriam, what is ketogenics? Let's, so we've been talking about your son, Rafi, and his sup- turnaround from t- brain cancer when he started the diet. But uh, describe to us what is ketogenic because I think a lot of us are like, hmm, scary, scary sounding well, word. I think when people, when they hear ketogenic, sometimes they may relate it to like celebrity weight loss. Because that's what's out there, the Kim Kardashian and, you know, and, and the celebrities that have done ketogenic diet. Um, and, th- and then the other group that they may associate it with is um, like elite athletes, because you, you'll hear about ultra marathoners and they're on this ketogenic diet. Um, but really where the ketogenic diet started as a therapy was, as I mentioned earlier, was with epilepsy, with pediatric epilepsy in particular. So it has this you know, this, this very imposing name, that's why the first part of my book is just plain keto for cancer. I, you know, it's like, let's simplify it, keto for cancer. The second part of that title is for the practitioners that I want to read this, because it's a, it is a good practitioner handbook. Uh, it gives them the most information, the nuts and bolts that they need to work with somebody. So but in um, a way that I, even I, who am not a practitioner, I'm just a thriver, <laughs> yeah. could understand yeah. the entire book. So, I so, was... so, yeah, when I'm talking about ketogenic diet, I'm talking about therapeutic ketogenic diet as an add-on or what they call an adjunct in cancer. So, so what you're doing is you're adding this to whatever therapy. And some people choose just to go with an alternative therapy. I don't judge. I just educate. Right. So, um, so in, in Rafi's case, so you got this at, this, at that point, he was seven years old, ketogenic diet for him meant, okay, well, we can't have any more of this mac and cheese. You know, I thought he was eating a pretty healthy diet, you know, but you know, no more mac and cheese. But what we can do is make a cheese sauce and put it on noodled or, um, you know, zucchini strips. We can do it that way. And, you know, and instead of having a sandwich, we can slice meat thinly and, and do some, you know, sliced meat roll-ups, send those off to ev- even to school with him. You know, he loved custards. Uh, he loved the parfaits we made. He loved Caesar salad. His chicken Caesar salad was sort of his go-to when we'd go out to eat. Uh, so, it, you know, there was just these modifications to a diet. It's a different mix of familiar foods. So here's the familiar foods. We're cutting out the carbohydrates. We're down to like like 20 grams of carbohydrate, which is roughly like somewhere around three to 5%. Remember, this is therapeutic for cancer. Three to right. 5% of total carbohydrates. You're keeping protein really low because high protein activates a lot of cancer promoting pathways. So you're keeping protein just to what is needed in the body and, and no more. And then the balance of intake is going to come from fats and oils. And that's like two and a half times what people are accustomed to taking in. 
So the challenge is, is, you know, understanding what you're doing and then putting that kind of plan into action in this kind of hostile food environment that we live in. And, you know, I'm very fond of saying it's a toxic food environment. I'm not talking just about the toxins in the soil. I'm talking about the amount of sugar and grain and poor quality ingredients that are in, you know, in, the, in these supermarket products that are even in the specialty store products. They're just substituting one sugar for, you know, for like organic cane syrup. Sorry, that's not going to do it. You got to just get rid of the sugars. I like it how you said hostile food environment. I've thought that too, as I've been trying to navigate my own change in diet, <laughs> that some at first had go gluten free. And then I look at the lot, a lot of the processed gluten free oh products God, and yeah. I'm like, oh my goodness, there's as many unpronounceable words in this as there is in that over, other one over there. <laughs> <laughs> but starting with like tapioca starch or rice starch, which is actually more, uh, the glucose in those is more readily accessible than the glucose in sugar. Not, you know, sugar is still very damaging, but, you know, understand that when you're talking about a starch, you're talking about two glucose molecules that are bond together so lightly that they begin to digest in your mouth. They don't even need to get to your stomach to, to wow. release glucose molecules. You chew, yeah. just think about chewing the soda cracker thing, you know, from, from like middle school science uh, and how it turns sweet in your mouth. Well, it's turning sweet because you've broken the bonds of the starch and you're feeling, you're, you're sensing the, the glucose, the underlying glucose. So we'll be right back. The best of holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free. AscendingHearts.com. <laughs> My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio, and we'll explore these topics and so much more on Destination Unlimited. What are all the things you witness online in a day? Cats playing piano, selfies on your feed, your friend's picture being turned into a nasty meme that's been shared 50 times, 51, 52. When someone's being bullied online, it's hard to know what to do. Now you can speak up with the witness emoji. It looks like an eye in a speech bubble, and it's in the symbol section near the clocks in your phone. You'll let the world know it isn't cool, and you'll let your friend know you care. Learn more at eyewitnessbullying.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio. I'm your host, Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. You know, I just want to throw this in. I read something the other day, and I was so shocked by it. I had never thought of it, actually. I had thought of the idea that the digestive system, the mouth to the exit, shall we say, is all one big long tube. But I didn't realize, and I don't know why I didn't realize this, but you start to not only when you chew and everything with the enzymes that happen, but you actually start digesting your food in your mouth. And I was like, wow, that is, I had no idea when I was reading that. So many things that I'll say as lay people don't understand about what we're doing to our bodies and what we're putting into our mouth. Yeah, it really, there, there should be a lot more emphasis in it. Uh, in our education, but even, you know, that, that what they're going to do is just present the paradigm, which is leading us down this road of increasing obesity, um, earlier diagnosis of devastating diseases like, you know, type, type 2 diabetes, you, you know, this, the, the neurodegenerative, the, you know, you look at the rise in the, in the uh, incidence of Alzheimer's, and you look at Parkinson's disease, and it's my belief that we can address 
all of these diseases autoimmune too by looking at the underlying causes of it instead of treating the symptoms and i know i'm like with your audience i'm you know preaching to the choir here but <laughs> instead of addressing the symptoms why not look at what caused the imbalance imbalance to start with bring the body back into balance by by changing something and allowing our bodies to adapt to that change in a way that supports health and definitely cutting down on carbohydrates i'm a firm believer in in the need for everyone to do that i i want to make it clear although my son was on this diet it it was because he had cancer and kids with epilepsy are on the diet because they they have this you know this uncontrollable you know seizure disorder but i don't believe that parents should be popping their kids on ketogenic diets as a preventive me- measure kids need to grow they need to thrive in a in an environment that includes yeah maybe ketogenic but uh basically they they need to be in more of an anabolic state than what uh ketogenic allows for so there are compromises with children and you know i want to be clear with that um and i think like a paleo program for kids is ideal autoimmune proto- uh, protocols there's paleo protocols for autoimmune like the walls protocol so when somebody comes to me and they have cancer and i'm doing my intake and i find out they have you know one or two or three autoimmune diseases as well i make sure that they become aware that there's this autoimmune pr- protocol that they uh can merge basically seamlessly with ketogenic and move forward with that so they're addressing more than just their cancer Oh, good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Let's get into a little bit of the nuts and bolts, though, of this merging. Well, I'll say let's talk real world here. I know we have been in a way, but when we say carbohydrates, are we talking just about the breads and things or are we leaving out specific fruits and vegetables? Or oh, yeah. We were talking sort of high level about more fats and oils, but that I'm like, well, there are a lot of oils that I wouldn't be ingesting. So let's get into a few of like real world foods that uh, are are good for overall health. Okay, we can we can touch on the on the basics and then people can find on my website dietarytherapies.com they can find a food list for ketogenic if they're curious about seeing more of the recommendation. So as far as the vegetables go, the emphasis is on the non-starchy vegetables. So uh, so this is going to exclude root vegetables initially and it's going to exclude a lot of the uh, squashes. So if you're initially, depending on the, the type of cancer, like somebody with brain cancer has, a, has to stay in a much narrower window as far as their food choices than somebody that's newly diagnosed with breast cancer. There we're going to address it with a wider range of vegetables. We're going to get into more of the colorful vegetables like, like what's described in, the, in that Wall's Paleo Plus. So the emphasis is on basically on cruciferous vegetables, leafy greens, saute greens there's uh you know celery cucumbers those things are you know definitely can be included they don't have as much they're not packaged with much as um of the anti cancer effects as the cruciferous vegetables are but they're included because they're low carb as far as the fruits go they're really especially in the beginning there there um is not any room for um for fruits you know, maybe a, a wedge or two of grapefruit, maybe a few slices, thin slices of apples. As far as berries go, yeah, you can include some berries, uh, like a quarter of a cup of strawberries or blackberries or raspberries is considered, considered a serving and you would always have it with the fat. So with a therapeutic ketogenic diet, you're, you're keeping carbs very low, protein in, you know, just adequate, filling in with fats, and then you're dividing those up over the meals that you're going to eat for the day. And you're also in- including, at least in my plan, you're including um, more pressure on the cancer cells by doing a, a, a daily fasting regimen. So you stop eating at dinner, you don't eat before bedtime, you get up in the morning, you have a cup of uh, bulletproof something, and, uh, and then you get to that first meal of the day a little later in the morning. And that gives you, you know, ideally for women, gives you around 14 hours of a daily fast and guys can take it to 16, some even 18 hours. Uh, But I don't recommend going that, that narrow for, uh, for, for women, for the most part, we're just built differently. We have have (laughs) hormone influences, our physiology is different. 
And what we read about what works for men can't necessarily be assumed for women. And I see women struggling trying to narrow that in eating window more. So we do the intermittent, it's called daily intermittent fasting. And then another type of fasting, which is the short-term fasting around chemotherapy. And eventually, even if somebody's heavy to start with and they're doing this kind of therapeutic weight loss through calorie restriction, we're still going to put these other parts in, these other pieces in, and increase the pressure on the cancer cells. And at some point, that ideal weight is reached, and then you're relying more on this intermittent fasting that's happening on a daily basis, and this, if they're still on chemotherapy, this fasting around the chemotherapy. Wow. Okay. That's fascinating to me. And it is pretty limited at first, but gosh, if it works, I'm a... Yeah. And and, and the the options expand. After somebody's been in ketosis for a couple of months, they can experiment with with adding either larger servings of some of the vegetables that they're using or um, vegetables that may be a little higher in carbohydrate. Um, Maybe even like uh, uh, some of the root vegetables, like like, uh, carrots, grated carrot, as a, as a condiment on a salad or, you know, some chopped beet on a salad. Um, but always, always looking at how the body is responding. And my body's going to respond one way. Your body is going to, you know, even if we look similar on the surface, it's going to respond differently. So I, 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 in, in order to liberalize the diet for cancer, that's where the blood testing comes in. I know people don't want to do it, but um, on a limited basis, I think it's really important to to um, to test your response to foods if you want to liberalize the diet. Oh, absolutely. And also doing, I learned through this, mine is adding one food at a time so you could know which is the offending. Yeah. And I, I, I walk people through that in my book about, um, you know, taking that one food, put popping it into a meal, testing before and then testing after, comparing that to, to when you didn't have that amount in there and and basing how you move forward with the diet how you're going to change it and i mean it all sounds so complicated and and part of what i do for people is to bring it back to how simple it is it's about carbohydrates about putting a a a, a protein on the plate you know a, 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 an allowable amount of carbohydrate and then the rest of it is going to be fats and that's what you do at each meal and then you have some high fat snacks uh, in that eating window as as well to kind of uh, make up the fats that you're not um, taking in th- during the meals. So, yeah. I mean, it, it works. Keeping it simple works. I have a simple meal template that I include in the book, and sometimes that is enough for people. They get a handle. They can manage their disease with just using the simple meal template, and it brings it all down from this overwhelm and this, oh, my God, how am I, you know, the stress that people can create around getting this diet dialed in. It's like, let's get rid of that. Let's start here. And as you learn and feel comfortable, maybe you do want to start looking at the quality of your food. Um, and then, may, you know, maybe you do want to uh, see if you can widen your eating choices. Maybe you want to experiment with trying to dine out now, whereas I don't recommend that in the first month or so. I found dining out at first was really hard for a variety of reasons, but major reasons were even if you read this whole description of what supposedly was in there, more often than not, I found there was always something else <laughs> that I shouldn't. Or well, Not only that, but the food quality isn't going to be what you want when you go out. Right. To, the olive oil is not going to be what you want to have at home. But, you know, it's like you're dining out. There's reasons for dining out. It's either for, you know, convenience on that night or to socialize. And so you just kind of put that aside and focus on what you came here for this. So, you know, if you came for the food, if you needed the food, then go for it. But if you're there for the socializing, you could sit there and pick on an appetizer and you know, <laughs> eat before you go out to dinner and pick on an appetizer yeah. and you won't do as much damage as if you're, you know, having to make all of these decisions about, oh my God, what's in the sauce and, and oh, you know, there's going to be you know, a starch on my plate or whatever. I mean, you can simplify yeah. for dining out too. Absolutely. Well, we need to, we're up against the clock again. We need to take another quick commercial break. And when we come back from this, we're going to talk about the that scary word, fats, that she keeps mentioning. Because I think a lot of us are like, she keeps mentioning uh, oils and fats, and I've been told not to have those for years and years. So we'll be right back. 
Connecting you with the best of the conscious minds in the world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Change and growth are part of natural life and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. Upgrade yourself with the Ohm Times Experts program. With Ohm Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.ohmtimes.com. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for inspired conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. Hey, Dr. Phil here. You know, I help people solve difficult problems every day, but one problem has me stumped, childhood hunger. Nearly 16 million children in America struggle with it. Luckily, the Feeding America network of local food banks collects surplus food, giving hope to hungry children and their families. But they need your help. Join me in supporting Feeding America and your local food bank at feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio. I'm your host, Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And tonight we're talking with Marion Kalamian, and she's the author of the brand new great book called Keto for Cancer, Ketogenic Metabolic Therapy as a Targeted Nutritional Strategy. And this is a comprehensive book. It starts with her personal story that she shared just the little bits with us about her son, Rafi, and his brain cancer, as well as everything that she's learned through that process, including going back to school, which just fascinated me because I find so many people that have these moments in their life that it absolutely changes the entire trajectory of their life. I know the autoimmune condition did for me. I know I wouldn't be here on the autoimmune hour if I hadn't done that. So we'll get into that towards the end. But let's uh, talk, talk to us about the big scary word, fat. Ah, oh, yes. Well, it's easier to talk about fat now than it was 10 or 15 years ago, because a reevaluation of the research that went into the guidelines has shown that it, there was a lot of bias, number one. There was the bias of Ansel Keys and the people in his circle in interpreting the data. So these, uh, these people who have independently gone back and reviewed all of the data, not just the cherry-picked stuff, have come back and said, boy, you know, we really don't have enough evidence to support the fact that a higher fat diet is going to be detrimental to us in in some way. And, you know, I I look at that and I go, we're making baby steps in the right direction. But people with cancer don't have the luxury of time. They need to act now and, and do something decisive, even if, you know, 10 years from now, we find that it wasn't perfect, at least it was a move in the right direction. And, it, you know, and I look back, you know, what I did for my son, and I said, I made a lot of mistakes, and I didn't have a lot of knowledge to work from. And it was still, you know, effective. You know, we kicked the can down the road for six years with this little guy. We got him to the age of 13. And, you know, nobody really expected that he was going to survive till 13. This was just not a survivable cancer. Wow. You know, that was the part of the story that took me by surprise. And although we're saying it didn't have the ultimate outcome that we wanted, it still brought an amazing amount of research and things to the table, which I so appreciate you being able to offer this to us now. I'm just interested in the idea of fat. I mean, uh, to be honest, I grew up in that era where that was just you know, a four letter word missing a letter. I mean, it was just like, like, oh my gosh, we shouldn't, don't have fat, don't add butter, don't, you know, whatever. In ketogenics, it's all, all about 
obviously quality fat. So let's talk about, yeah, exactly. yeah, it's okay to have fats because I still struggle with all of those years of mindset. And I've read your book, I've read other ketogenic books and the Walls Protocol and other things, and it talks about more fat. And I understand how that our body needs it, but it's still, I have to find, I still bump into old beliefs about it. It's easy to let that be the stopper. And I find that that is the hardest thing for people to address. They understand lowering carbs and there's plenty of information about that. And they, they, they finally get, you know, they may not initially understand the protein part of it, but they get the protein. And the hardest part is to increase the amount of fat. And when you are talking about twice or two and a half times the amount of fat, you do want to be very careful about the quality of the fats that you're taking in. So, you know, you do this pantry purge. And, and <laughs> I love that like, pantry purge. <laughs> if you've got any of these low quality oils anywhere, not only should you not be eating them, but your family shouldn't. And one of my things I point out is soybean oil and how inflammatory soybean oil is. So yeah, we know the, that there's science on trans fats. We know that trans fats are bad for us, but we should be equally cognizant of the fact that soybean oil and corn oil, you know, Wesson oil, Crisco, whatever, all of those things are bad for us. And, and so it really comes down to a couple of very healthy oils, avocado, of course, extra virgin olive oil, if you can, if you can get good quality, not tainted stuff. Be careful of your sources for the oils, guys. That's the one thing. It took me a while to find my own trusted sources for oils. But one thing I love about olive oil is I live in the Pacific Northwest, and I'll say I don't know how long they've been there, maybe five or more years. We're starting to get our own local source of olive oil. Exactly. I'm so thrilled. I just go down the road an hour, and I can see them pressing it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The local, the stuff that's that's uh, produced in this country is not um, adulterated. The stuff that's coming in from other countries, you got to be very careful about it. So, I, you know, I even saw one recently, and it and it was insinuating with the title in big bold letters that it was coming from California. But when I looked, I went, mm, I don't believe it. So I looked at you know finer print on the label and it was actually coming from outside the country and being packaged in California. So there's a lot of deception around olive oil. So just be really well, I think careful. there's a lot of deception around a lot of products. I, I, that's not the only thing that I've ever seen that on where it'll say something and I'm like, oh, wow. And then I read the fine print and it's like, mm, wow, not really true. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, you know, good quality oils, the best butter that you can, that you can buy or have uh, available to you, you know, it's like, if in the beginning, all you're going to find is supermarket butter, go for it. At, at least it's a start. And then as you're into this, you can upgrade the quality of the butter or the cream that you're using. And some, some cancers, we're not even using butter or cream, you know, estrogen. Well I have a question about butter. Um, what, as oftentimes we hear, I think, I hope you pronounce it right, ghee. Uh-huh. And I mean, it looks and smells like butter. <laughs> it's, Is that- it's actually, it's a form of clarified butter. So it's, uh, it's butter that's had all of the protein removed from it. Right? So it doesn't, like if you were to take butter and uh, a stick of butter, put it in a Pyrex dish and put it in a, a microwave or heat it on the stove, you you know, it would melt out. And then if you just let it sit there, you would see an accumulation of sort of debris on the bottom of the Pyrex bowl. And that, those aren't contaminants. Those are just things that happen to be in the cream that's coming from, from the cow, from the dairy animal. So it's, it's, it, you know, it's not, they're not just making the fats, there's other things in it. So it's, it's, a con, you know, it's, it's got the proteins in it and some other things. So with, if you do that and you just drain off the liquid, that's called clarified butter. Now, if you take it another step, and I can't recall exactly what they do to make ghee, is like a further purification of it. And that is kind of a shelf-stable form of butter. doesn't even need to be refrigerated, can, can stay out. So the thing about ghee is that it's more, uh, it's more closely aligned to being a fat than it is, uh, than butter is. Butter has a lot of moisture and these other things in it. So that's the only difference. Um, And I would like to think, no, I don't have the science on this. I would like to think that it doesn't have the same degree of estrogen metabolites in it that you'd find in butter or cream. 
because those things can be a complication in hormone-sensitive cancers. But uh, I have, I go into detail on it in my book because I think it's really important to, number one, distinguish between dairy fats and dairy proteins, and then two, to talk about the benefits and the limitations of both of these when you're talking about cancer. Because I've had people come to me with brain cancer and thinking that they can't have you know, butter, because they've heard somewhere that there's a problem with, with, um, you know, with uh, dairy products. And, and it's like, well, you know, I'm going to ask them to cut down on the amount of cheese they're eating, but I'm not going to ask them to limit the amount of dairy fats, because I really don't believe that this is, is going to have an effect um, on the outcomes in brain cancer. I haven't seen any proof of that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's just so much to know. And unfortunately, we're just about out of time. Share with us, if you will, want to know first where to get your book and uh, how people can learn more about you. So I know you shared your website before, but share with us again, as well as I know that there's so many things we didn't get a chance to cover. I've got multiple questions here on my (laughs) list, (laughs) but um, one or two things that you wish that people knew about keto uh, for cancer or just ketogenics in basically, before we have to go. First, you can learn more about what I do and on dietarytherapies.com. And I do have a link there to to Amazon and I, it's an affiliate link. So I'd love it if people used my link. It's the same price as, it, as going on Amazon. So that's how they can get my book. But also just by going on my website, you get food lists and other things that are really beneficial. Learn a lot more about my son's story there too. I have a Facebook page under my name, Miriam Kalamian, and I have a a dietary therapy um, Twitter account. So uh, those are ways that people can connect with me. They can connect with LinkedIn as well. And the takeaways as far as keto goes is if you're, if it's even mildly uh, attractive to you to think that you can impact cancer by changing the mix of foods that you eat, understand that ketogenic is not just an anti-cancer diet. So you, it's not, people have asked me that, how does it, you know, how, how does it compare to Gerson or Budwig? It's like, there's no comparison because this is actually, we're understanding what's happening at the level of the mitochondria. And you don't get that with Gerson or Budwig because there is no science behind it. So it, you know, if you want confirmation of that, just go to clinicaltrials.gov. And you'll see that there's a, you know, a whole host of clinical trials that are looking at ketogenic diet and not just in cancer, but in, uh, you know, it's expanding. There's a, you know, ketogenic therapy is going to become a big player in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Um, And, and so, you know, if anybody that, or I shouldn't say if anybody, for your listeners who are in middle age at this point, you know, really seriously consider, you know, moving more towards a low carb or ketogenic plan to preserve your, um, your mental clarity um, moving forward from that point, because nature doesn't really care about us <laughs> past midlife. But, but if, if we can keep the, the impact of sugars low from midlife on, then we have a much, I feel, we have a much better chance at keeping everything intact, staying healthy, and zooming off that cliff uh, in our old age rather than just kind of tottering off of it. And that, that's my goal is for, for walking the walk here is just to, to, to maintain my health, maintain my mental state healthy, not get these new neurodegenerative diseases that are afflicting us. I'm never going to have diabetes. I can tell you that right now. It's just not going to happen. Well, bravo, bravo. And I too, there's that famous quote of sliding into the grave sideways, yelling wahoo or something like that. That's one of my favorite quotes. (laughs) So I can't even remember. I'm not even sure I ever knew who said that. So I apologize for not doing the attribution to whatever great mind uh, was thinking along the lines that I love to think about. And thank you so much, Miriam, for being on the show. We really appreciate you exploring the ketogenic diet with us. And Everyone, be sure and go to get her new book. It's called Keto for Cancer. And have a great weekend, whatever your adventures. Uh, Join me here next week, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, for another interesting episode. Uh, We're just going to have fun every Friday night, 7 p.m. And before I forget, go over to lifeinterruptedradio.com. 
and subscribe to Transcribe Tribe. It's something new that we're doing. The team here is busily doing it. We've got most of them done, but not all. So if you don't see the one you want, just give us a quick little email through the website. Tell us which one you're looking for if it's not there, and we'll get it up lickety split. We've got over 150 episodes now. So like I said, we didn't start this three and a half years ago. We just started it recently. So we're trying to play catch up here, guys. But it's been fun to transcribe these, and, and it's always helpful to be able to go back and see, you know, okay, yeah, I'm download it and share it with friends as well share the podcast with friends please it's available here at lifeinterruptedradio.com and all the other great outlets that it's always on as always have a great weekend whatever your adventures and enjoy the information provided on lifeinterruptedradio.com is for educational purposes only what you hear read and see on life interrupted radio is based on experience only The information presented here should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on Life Interrupted Radio. You've been listening to Life Interrupted Radio. To learn more, listen to other shows, and gain free resources that can help empower your life, be sure to stop by lifeinterruptedradio.com. Do you want to be a better leader, have better relationships, become more self-aware, be a better communicator? Hi, I'm Sharon Saylor, best-selling author, professional speaker, and executive coach, and my life passion is empowering professionals to be the best that they can be. After years of working with professionals, I've discovered the seven things nobody is telling you that can cost you your clients, sales, and even your career. And I want to give it to you free. You've heard my show. You know my passion. And maybe we'll be working together sooner rather than later. So go grab this ebook now to find out the seven things that's costing you big time over at SharonSailor.com forward slash radio gift.